muted. Yeah. Got it. Right, okay, we're, we're live on YouTube. A big apologies for um, the, the delay today. And I just want to, uh, just want to basically um, work, work out who we've got tonight. So um, I'm just gonna grab a pen um, and grab my little book, which, which, I, which I've got in front of me. And we've got a pen. And if I can set this up here, um, oh, that looks a bit dodgy, doesn't it? So, uh, right, okay. So, so we've got Andy, haven't we? We've yep. got uh, no David then. Yeah. All yep. oh, right. Okay. Uh, Peter. Yep. Anne. Yes. Margaret. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh God, Drina. Unknown host. Yeah. <laughs> An unknown host. Hang on a minute. Hang on. Oh, right, I got one down twice. Ooh. Okay, okay, so one, one of the things I want to start off with, uh, if we sort of clean that there, one of the things I wanted to start off with is basically by setting the scene that we had sort of from last week. And the scene was that, um, you know, Margaret um, reminded us of this great lake, this great glacial lake that suddenly burst its banks. And mm. she said, oh, well, we mentioned that before you, but that you dismissed it. But before I go to my, to my betterment, when we were talking about that sort of great glacial lake in North America, it just didn't seem appropriate when we did it. But last week, when we were looking at Doggerland, the, the point that was made last week was that we've concentrated too much on the eastern seaboard of Britain. And the failings have also been that we've concentrated too much um, on Britain and we haven't looked really at continental Europe and the effect of the loss of Doggerland on continental Europe. You know, many people who look at Doggerland, they say, oh, poor Britons, you know, we've been isolated, you know, and all the loss of life and all the loss of land and we've got a fear of the sea and so on. We've got to think that that actually happened to people in Europe as well. And when we talk about Doggerland, we always think about people on the east coast of Britain. We very rarely talk about people on the West Coast. You know, the, the data on the West Coast now with, with the Shannon Valley landscape, with, with Merseyside, with the islands of the lower, um, of, of the um, Inner Hebrides, the Lower Hebrides, the Inner Hebrides. Um, we, we don't seem to focus on those types of areas. And then tonight we actually go to the Scilly Islands, which seems to be quite appropriate in, in regards to what we were looking at last week and Doggerland. And, and then what we do see is, is a map that gives you um, a sharp, stark impression of, of what the silly islanders through time have gone through over a short period of time between 12,000 years ago, maybe, and when maybe Doggerland was lost. So I, I think what we're going to do is go straight into that. Um, and Peter might be able to navigate us a bit more. But however, let's just get into this. Now, this is this is very interesting. And what what we've sort of got is the land as it sort of retreats. Um, and you can sort of see you can see this sort of patch over here, can't you? in the grey, that, that's where we have it today. Um, and you can see the Scilly Islands over on the left. Um, and you can basically get an impression of these light areas, these dark green areas, give you an impression of the land that's been lost. Now, what we're not going to do is, is say in what time, fashion and span this has actually occurred. So, you know, it, it wasn't too much of a, um, a hop and a jump. If you can think about those darker gray areas, 
between those green areas and the silly islands and was sort of thinking well you know um you know were, were you able to walk over to the silly, silly islands at one stage mm -hmm. uh, you could argue yes whatever but but you can see all the land that's been lost and that's quite stark mm -hmm. that's very stark um and it takes somebody like peter to think well look at the area that's been lost is that what you're feeling uh, peter yes well yes in the in the center of that curve there of the white which is the land as it is now as is where i was born at port levin hmm. and, and, and that, that that's that, all that green stuff's a big area lost all that isn't green it? stuff what is, is now sea as you say but the, the one um, thing that go on pete go on well the, the, what, what we see as land now is our major uh, granite outcrops and very hard granite uh, granite outcrops, which didn't get worn away, didn't get washed away because of their hardness and their, their solidity, I would imagine. And, and we've, got, we've got to presume that, we've got to presume two things, haven't we, Peter, that, that all that green area that we're seeing, that's either, that was either low lying areas or that area um, at the same time as being eroded away. I would um, think so, yes. Yeah, so, you know, we, we could we could just stipulate um, one way or another, and we could basically think, well, <laughs> we could think that, but, um, you know, different ways of how that's been eroded, but that's quite a big area to lose. Oh, and yes. then if we, if, we, if we go down here, this is the map as it's starting to progress. Now, it, it's again what 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 we are seeing between those two that probably sometime maybe by the end of maybe by the end of the Mesolithic period, um, and it it's sort of there there are some shaded dates there, but maybe actually going into the Mesolithic period sort of as, as the Mesolithic period is drawing out, right? We start to see that land regressing quite a lot. Um, and then it's showing this little green blob here and this little green blob, this large land mass, which is that there, this large land mass getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and obviously this is sort of, this starts to get into uh, the sense of the islands today and that their excavation where you're coming across um, Mesolithic archaeology. Now if we sort of look at all these and we we maybe um, think about the dates and we maybe think about what's going on but clearly this whole world, this whole landscape is slowly being eroded away and lost. So even even this land mass here with a little black dot that has been reduced it's been reduced and it's been reduced and it's been reduced so all of this giving you the sense of the calamity this is this is what i now, now need to put into the calamity that people associated with the silly islands were having to face and they still face today now it's not just one island it's a number of islands and trying to get into the grip say say you're thinking well you know all of this land is being lost over time but it's, it's probably the same experience that people suffered in regards to doggerland what you can see what you can clearly see i'm doing tonight is is what i am doing is i'm i'm saying that what's occurring on the eastern coast uh, uh, between 12,000 and 8,000 years ago, and then it continues into the Neolithic period, is the same experience that we get on, on the West Coast. Not just Ireland, not just the, Wel the Welsh coastline, not just, not just you know, the, the islands in the um, Inner Hebrides, but this is actually happening with the Silly Islands as well. Now, one thing I can remember doing on the weekend we had we had the the excursion group in in a place called Aberirum, 
And this overlooks Cardigan Bay. Now, Cardigan Bay, if you look at the map there, Cardigan Bay, uh, you've got Wales there, is smack bang in the middle of the, the coastal area of Wales, right? So that, that's basically Cardigan Bay. Now, Cardigan Bay, there was a lot more land of Cardigan Bay um, 7,000 years ago. Um, and there was this sort of, this is this is very relevant. And, and actually what I might do is I, I might just try to articulate what I'm saying about West Wales to try and bring us into the Scilly Islands. Um, and I think that would be a very sensible thing to do. So what, what we're going to do is there is another, this links us into the same calamity, Cardigan Bay. So if we can get this up here now quickly. I wasn't going to do this, but we're going to do it anyway. Images. <clears throat> right, here we go. Hang on. Sort of, you get lots of images of this sort of Cardigan Bay landscape. Um, and if we, if we sort of, um, hang on, if, what I'm trying to do is, you've got all these nice little images on, on the screen, right? So we tap on there. Now, one thing it's believed that at 6,000 years ago, the coastline may have been out as far as where the D is there, and maybe as far as the A in the word Bay. So that's a big area that's been lost. Now, there's a point to me mentioning this. How do we know? Well, there's stories of the lost land of, of out off the West Wales coast. There's, there's different stories being told. What we do know is if we go to this place when we write in the word both um, and trees, we've done this before, I know, but this is this is relevant to what we're doing. Right. OK. Look at these. You, you just need to see this. And you're thinking, well, that world off Cardigan Bay were these trees and and that's what you can see today and these these trees keep going underneath the water and they keep going this is this is a, a low tide so if if you if you keep going you keep going you've got these tree stumps you've got these tree stumps um and they're associated with that lost world of cardigan right um and the reason why this links in with sicily sicily and uh, the silly islands sorry the silly islands is that you can probably think of the same experience that these people are suffering and feeling that, that a world's being lost. Um, and one phrase I'm going to use is Atlantis. The Scilly Islands has been described as Atlantis. This, this bay outside Cardigan Bay with all these tree stumps has also been described as Atlantis, the lost world, the lost experience. And we do know that people lived amongst these tree stumps off the, off the, um, off the West Wales coastline because um, tools are being found. Um, some of the trees have been cut down. Now there's another point to be talking about here. Where we've got people talking about the Scilly Islands as being sort of, you know, associated with the sort of myths and legends of, of, in connection with um, Atlantis. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it's basically that this, this idea of land lost and links is still in the human consciousness. You, you talk about this, people talk about the lost world off the West Wales coastline. And if we go back to the Scilly Islands, you're also talking about the same idea, the same experience as we're talking about today. So if we go back to there, hang on a minute, let's go back to where I was and bingo. So so again, again, this sort of, this this whole sort of, story this whole sort of idea um and what i'd like to do is i'd like to tell you from early times about the silly islands and then i'd like to tell you about um the mesolithic uh period um in regards to the silly islands so what we need to do is we need to think think here um and we need to go back to the paleolithic period um, and interestingly enough, there is evidence for Paleolithic activity 
on the Scilly Islands, there is evidence. It's very scant, but it's on display now at the uh, Truro, um, the, the Cornwall Museum in Truro. And basically, it, it's, it's, it's small fragments, very fine small fragments that have been found on the Scilly Islands associated with the Paleolithic period. Um, and then uh, the artifacts found there um, are an intriguing indication, again, an intriguing indication that before the melting of the ice 12,000 years ago, the people were visiting um, and were part of this archipelago during the climatic um, world, the climatic changes. Um, and some of this late evidence from the Paleolithic period is associated from the very cold landscape that existed before the melting of the ice 12,000 years ago, known as the Younger Dryas, which we've mentioned before. I mentioned this, haven't I, that um, um, leading up to about 14, 13,000 years ago, it was warming up and then suddenly there was, a, there was a massive cold snap, which we've mentioned before in the Paleolithic period called the Younger Dryas, and it got really cold. Well, interesting enough, it, we've got evidence of people living um, on the Scilly Islands, for example, in this very cold spell, which is really, really strange. And we do get a lot of sort of other evidence associated with the Scilly Islands and Cornwall. So this sort of the the one thing, again, that we can think about sort of huge change uh, in regards to the Scilly Islands is, is that, you know, the the evidence is is rather sort of um, is is rather sort of um, from one extreme to another. So yeah, you know, we've got sort of maybe some microclimate works going on um, on the Scilly Islands. Maybe maybe with 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 the Ice Age, maybe there are areas where it's not that bad. Maybe that's what this this evidence is telling us. So so what what we're gonna sort of um, what 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 we'll sort of get an idea with is is trying to sort of uh, maybe work out um, some of the little bits of evidence um, in regards to the Scilly Islands, um, and this is there's there's some really odd stuff here. So what we're going to do we're going to take another map up here, and we've we've got a few things to go through. So if we we do that, um, and there you are, that's the sort of Scilly Islands today. Now. Um, I think St. Mary's, um, St. Mary's Bay there, St. Mary's, St. Martin's. These are sort of familiar names, places. I know we've, I know one of you said last week that we've done the Silly Islands before. Yes, we have. I think we, um, I can't remember what the, what the lecture was exactly about, but it's definitely about the Silly Islands. And one of, one of the things that, that we, that we do find is that possibly from about 12,000 years ago, um, what what we what we do find is that when this was if we go back again when this was a little bit more like hang on a minute go back when the silly islands was a little bit more like this right when everything was joined together what what we do find twelve thousand years ago is that we do find evidence of small mammals. Um, and the evidence of the small mammals, which is quite unusual, unusual evidence, is from the surviving land archaeology. So if we go back to here, from the surviving land archaeology, what, what we can work out is that at least by 12,000 years ago, there were small mammals like the silly shrew, right, and the root vole. Right, root root voles and silly shrew, um, which is apparently the the, the silly shrew um, is only found on these islands, and and we think, well, why is that significant? Because we don't really talk about animals and mammals and other things that go bump in the night, but having having that this is this is very this is very poignant. Having these um, root voles spread around these islands and having the silly shrew evidence spread around these islands indicates clearly that these islands were all one at one stage. 
It didn't sort of swim to each individual island. And they would have got there somehow, somehow, right? So it's, it's of, what was that, Pete? Cal Tresco, to this day, has a microclimate of its own. And it's Can possible you... to grow uh, tropical plants on Tresco because of its microclimate. So is, is that not what we're saying, Peter? That, um, yeah, well, that's quite... what you were yeah. saying from the beginning. Yeah, there was a microclimate. That's right. Yeah. And it still exists yeah. today. And we we think about we think about this in fact that was a very good jump in there pete that, that was very very well planned so so the silly shrew and um you're talking about the microclimate tresco and you're talking about the root bowl this all being one sort of island um, and then we're thinking well one thing i've been intimating which might be sort of dangerous really but one thing i've been sort of intimating is that big bigger populations of people live in in amongst the ice within those so-called microclimates now i, I i'm not an, i'm not an expert on microclimates i'm not an expert on bioflora um and biofauna i but the evidence what we do in archaeology is we try to look at little bits of evidence and we say oh actually is 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 that is that is that what is going on? And I think that is what is going on. That we that we that we do have a world um, that is now starting to send us to understand that people lived within these landscapes in amongst the ice in the Paleolithic period. So it's still it's sort of saying about this sort of you know this landmass. Uh, this landmass that was sort of almost continuous that we we mentioned earlier on, and the reason why I didn't, the reason why I said don't take too much notice of the dates on here, um, is sort of saying that say maybe you could think that twelve thousand years ago you could probably walk across all that. This this grey area there is a bit sort of um, unambiguous. Is is that actually? Uh, low water is is that sort of doable this is what my notes were telling me um and it's it's sort of it's sort of saying that it's sort of saying that there was at least a separation um by eight thousand years ago um if not seven thousand years ago that, that this was completely an island now an island landscape and it's then started to talk about um, the mudflats is starting to talk about um, the type of uh, marsh, marshy mudflats that that you guys have got up in. You know, Andy knows them only too well, and so do you, David, at, at Grange. So, so that's the type of landscape that is now sort of occupying these areas that used to be sort of um, interestingly sort of flat, um, accessible land. Now it's starting to be very sort of boggy and sort of very sort of mixed um sort of landscape and things start to change um and it's it sort of it, i've actually got some sort of extra notes here and um what we do know and you guys would be familiar with this nautically wise um the silly islands are known to be one of the most uh most poignant places for ships to be wrecked um, and it's all down to the fact again that we're looking at this sort of all these levels i know the waters water in some places is sort of gradually rising right but but again um this sort of linked the landscape now the big question is and maybe we can get some answers on this because i'm going on to my other notes now the big question is um is there evidence um of a submerged woodland a submerged forest in amongst all those lighter green areas. So what I've got here is, is something that's written um, for uh, the people of Cornwall. And we're going to read this out. It's, it, it's entitled The Isles of Scilly in Ancient Times. And the Isles of Scilly are known as the Island of the Dead. Um, it sort of It sort of goes and it sort of says um, from a Bronze Age context um, and let's sort of look at that I, I know we're not doing a Bronze Age at this minute but I think this would be 
sort of a good idea to try and get us into the minds of the Tilly Islands in in the sort of um, this prehistoric land. And when we do bits of the Silly Island in the Neolithic period, we'll really understand it. So what they're saying is it's arguably, arguably, arguably um, that even, even as late um, as maybe four and a half thousand years ago, most of that was linked together. This is what my notes are saying, depending on which expert. This one says that it was all linked together. We've got different points of view here. In some respects, it was a more viable place to live than today because it was bigger and the climate was better, warmer and less wet, less windy and less stormy. The Isle of Scilly constituted a separate world, a somewhat mystical world traditionally reputed to be the island of the dead the isle of the dead and what does that exactly mean is it going way back to the time that this was all connected to the land or what does this mean but the isle of the dead and certainly the sheer number of burial orientated cairns and cairn fields on the island of today suggests that so you know it's it's a place that there's lots of burials and the Isle of the Dead could, ha however, be interpreted as an island beyond time. Ah, that's interesting. Is that going all the way back to the Mesolithic period or before the Mesolithic period or beyond normality? Well, let's just let's just keep that there as an idea. Now. The calamity that faced the people on the eastern seaboard in regards to the dock, loss of Doggerland, the, uh, the land regressing and the land being lost. Well, you could think that's all done and dusted 6,000 years ago. But if these notes are anything to go by, the slow drowning of all the lower valleys between these little islands continued into 4,000 years ago. So these people were continually facing loss, loss of land. So this, this word, the Isle of the Dead, the Isle beyond time and the, the place beyond normality, it is a place beyond normality. It's very different. In ancient times, it was reckoned that the souls of the dead went westward towards the setting sun. Chuck them over to the Scilly Islands. The tradition of, of a sunken land mass, mass Lioness, perhaps the uh, Scilly Isle or a landmass between uh, Scilly and the mainland adds to this mystique. So we've just we've just found something there. We've actually just found a lost world. Again, we started off with it, but we're going to go back to it and we're going to do Ow. some more of my notes. Go on, go on, Andy. Well, it's me, but... Uh... Uh, the, the violence of the sea around the Scilly Isles is such that uh, um, it creates a lot of damage, even to this day. Uh, where I lived in that, in that corner of Cornwall there, our, uh, my grandfather's garden was quite a large garden. And the 1920s, half of that garden was washed into the sea. And from today, the rest of it is gone as well. And that has Bloody been washed hell. away in the last... Uh, uh, 50, 60 years. Well, that's everything that I've just been saying. And, and, um, yeah. and when, when you think about it, right, um, we, sometimes we obsess about Doggerland um, and maybe we say it a little... The main Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it is. All the battering. You know, the Bay of yeah. Biscays, I know, massively south, but we know... Know the massive um, waves and the swirls uh, that are associated with that, you know. Yeah. So, so we th this is a really good point. I, I wanted to say about, you know, in these classes, what we do, we we um, we talk about, you know, we talked a lot about the loss of land. Well, the loss of land here, you know, the huge loss of land, you know, the 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 experience that we don't talk about. You know, Clement Reed was talking about Doggerland, right? But 
um, you know, this, this bit of the land was, lo- was not mentioned. No, nobody talks about this sort of um, lioness um, and, and this lost land. Um, and it's talking about sort of th- this thing that Andy, uh, you know, Peter would sort of associate with. Um, and we're going to read this now. Um, this is sort of, this heads, um, culturally, Silly was connected with West Penn Reef. Uh, culturally and physically um, and whatever happened in one um, in one generally happened in the other so what we've got is that on on the mainland and the Scilly Islands we've got similar burial traditions you know people are burying people in the same way even though the land bridge is lost now that's not by accident and that's not by coincidence it indicates that people are still linked there's still a commonality between the islands and the mainlanders um so the construction of what's going on on the mainland and silly uh, the silly islands um is very 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 similar in in, in constructional archaeology um however there are differences between what's going on with these in these islands and the mainland. Um, after all, even though they may have built and buried in the same way, um, the islanders being linked to the people on on the mainland in the summer months, but in the winter months they would have been completely completely isolated. In what Peter just said, there there they, it was just the, the waters the, the swell. Uh, the the access would have been beyond. There would be whole months where people from the mainland to and the Scilly Islands would not been able to sort of uh, link in any way, shape or form. And that that that's very that's a very very powerful point. So four in times that village in the where I was four, born, yeah, there quite often during the winter the waves break over the town all clock. That's how high they get. And that's how the damage that the, 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 that sea can do in that, those areas. It is extremely violent. And I, like I say, the waves go so high and break over the town all clock. And they sometimes show that for bad weather. And, and to be honest with you, Pete, my, my point that these people would, never, would not have been able to um, connect in the winter months is, is obviously borne out by what you've just said. And that's why there's so many wrecks because of the violence of the sea in that area. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, so one of one of the things one of the things that we do find is is that w- there is evidence of microliths, right? No, you you know you're thinking, well, okay, how isolated are these islands? Um, and what what there is 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 evidence of microliths, and you know, and one of the things one of the things that they have been doing um, is trying to look at um, the connection in in sort of experience um, to do with these islands, to do with the Isle of Man, to do with the Channel Islands, to do with the Outer Hebrides and maybe the Inner Hebrides and Orkney. Um, and what they what they've tried to start to do is say, well, actually, one thing that people forget, they, they, they forget about the Channel Islands being islands. They forget about the Scilly Islands being an island. Um, nobody thinks of the Isle of Man. They always think about Orkney being an island and the Outer Hebrides, right? But these type of areas are forgotten in the, in the overall design. Um, and one thing that we that they have been doing on the Scilly Islands is excavating. Um, and they've been coming across lots of microliths in more recent years. We know we know uh, those microliths, those those tiny bits of uh, flint tools, some of them the size of a fingernail. Um, and the very strange thing is. This is a strange point. When they've compared the microliths from the Scilly Islands to microliths on the mainland, they don't compute. They're actually very more similar in style to those that 
are from northern France, Brittany and Belgium. And that's been an unexpected find when they've been uh, working on the Sea Islands. So strangely enough, the, the, the links between, and so what we need to do is if we, if we sort of go back um, and we go these microliths, there they are. There they are excavating them. Um, and all these, the, these, these ones here um, are very different from these ones. So obviously the, these, these ones down here are from um, the likes of Star Car, right? Um, and these ones here are the types of ones that they actually find, the ones on the left here, these are the ones on the left, these are the ones that they are actually more being found in regards to the Scilly Islands. And there's one of the excavations, so they are excavating there. Um, so it's it's very it's very interesting to to see that there's links between the Scilly Islands and mainland Europe rather than links between the Scilly Islands and sort of Wiltshire or Hampshire or and so on. Um, I, but I've already said there was links between the people of with the burial tradition and all the rest of it. But is that that? That's that's by the by. I think the point being made is that there is links between the Scilly Islands, no matter how it comes across, and France and Belgium. And I think that's a really interesting point. So if we sort of, oh, there we go. Very different, very sort of subtle. You've got a nice jagged edge there. You know, these are not very big, right? So I'm looking at my thumb, right? And I'm thinking, my, my, my little finger. And basically the tip and a bit of my flesh and, and is, is basically, this is how small these are and they can actually be a bit smaller than that. So they, they are seeing that there's a cross channel relationship between the Scilly Islands and sort of um, Brittany and, and Northern France. Um, and it's it's discussed by by those doing the research that this might to be to do with um, um, Western seaways navigation. So it, it's said that people might be able to get to the Scilly Islands easier than they might be able to get to uh, the the Isle of Wight, and and which I find a bit sort of I'm not really don't really understand that, but it might be to do with the currents. I, I'm not um, I, I'm not there to sort of discuss that one but but again this sort of this experience that we're actually getting when when we look at uh, the silly islands this this very very interesting experience tells us that there's there's a lot more to the silly islands uh, than meets the eye so what we're going to do we're going to take a little bit of a break there um and then we're going to come back but we'll but what I'd like to do is see if there are any questions. So let's sort of go off here. Um, and there. Stop sharing. Right. I know Pete is going to want to say something. So go on, Pete. Well, all, all those. Uh, there has to be a reason for people living there. Uh, obviously, it was a very nice place to live because of its uh, microclimate, etc. Very easy to grow things, probably. All those chips, those chips of plinths could be just the chips of uh, plint making a larger tool, like an axe. And so rather than them being the tools themselves, they were just chips of manufacturing of a larger tool. But there must have been a lot of act activity over there. And there must have been a reason for all that activity. Uh, and what is the reason? That's the thing. Or, or maybe, yeah. maybe these people just become isolated. Well, maybe yes, but you know, yeah, go on. They can't be isolated if if they've found links from the burial practices with the mainland UK and the microliths with Brittany. That says that they're not isolated. Thanks for coming back at me with that one. Yes, you are right. You 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 are right. So. They're isolated, but they're not. So there's something more powerful going on. Yeah, yeah. yes. And yeah, good. That's what we needed. So 
so if we want to put everything together from from being the word isolated, what Peter's just said, what Andy's just said, it makes a very interesting experience. And I would say the same experience as Orkney. Yeah, uh, because it's the same experience as Orkney. This is why I did it. You, you got caught out there because um, you, we've dragged in Orkney. And the reason why we've been caught out there is that it, 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 that's what I said at the beginning. There's this idea that the, the experience of people on the Channel Islands with the, with these people on the Scilly Islands, with with the Outer Hebrides, with 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 Orkney, with the Isle of Man is the same experience where there is isolation. But there's trade, there's there's links going on and there's there's stuff going on, as Peter said, um, and as Andy said, as I said, that, that people want to be there. They, they, they physically go to these locations. They live in these locations. They're still there today. Um, and there's technology there as well. To be able to get there and back requires s- sophisticated ships and, and knowledge of the sea. Yeah. They would have been mm. sailing, wouldn't they? Definitely. Yeah, and, and not not just like the square rig things because they they would struggle. That I would I would suggest that they've got to be quite sophisticated boats because it's easy to go one because the prevailing wind is from the west there, so it's easy to come from the Scilly Isles to the mainland. You just get blown along, but you, to go back again isn't that easy. So they've got to be know what they're doing and and, you know, and, and it, i don't I, you, can you see them from i certainly can't see them from from france but oh, you, can you see them from land's end um only from my ground on a clear day right so it's not it's not that easy so the, the, no, there's navigation no you have to be on a high ground on a clear yeah. day there's got to be navigation then hasn't there as well so it's oh, yeah. even more sophisticated yeah yeah so these well, might- lifts that they found that they think are from Belgium and France. No, they're, 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 they're similar to those in Belgium and France. That's the point. It's a they're slight difference. They're, they're, they're similar. They're similar. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm. What are the tides like around the Scilly Islands? I suppose they get the first... Yeah. Wave. I mean, it's a huge body of water, the Atlantic. They must mm. be mm. really battered at times. Um, the tides would be less than the Severn, less than the uh, Severn estuary. The Severn estuary, the tides are so big because of the rivers running into it as well. And yeah. you've got the May, you've got the Severn, you've got the uh, Avon, you've got the Wye, all these rivers coming down against the tide, which makes the tide rise that much higher yeah. on the Severn estuary. But you don't have that over on the Scilly Isles. The Scilly Isles. I was rising tide according to the uh, fluctuations of the moon. Mm. We've got quite shallow water all around the UK, haven't we? D- doesn't that mean that we get bigger tides than normal? Because we're part of the continental shelf, aren't we? So we're quite shallow. But that doesn't necessarily mean you get bigger tides. No. But we did. Some places do. Yeah, like like, like yeah. Barry in the Vale of Glamorgan, which has the yeah. fourteen meter well, rise be- tide. because of the rivers. Yeah, yes, yeah. running yeah. against the tide. You see, those major rivers like the Severn, the Avon, the Wye, yeah, uh, we, the Usk, all those rivers coming against the tide. Yeah, we have we have we have ten meters, but yeah. but we have lots of little islands dotted around that mm. are cut off from the mainland at certain times of the day, like Lindis Farm. And a couple of the um, Scilly Isles you, that mm. get to one another at certain times of the day. There's Sunderland Point. There's lots of places. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Out, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That are uh, reliant on the tide going out. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure at some point that would have been a case, but I don't, I don't know when that when it became a full island. No. But it's cert- certainly been a, an island for a very long time. So. I guess they're warmed by the Gulf Stream, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It goes all the way up to the Inner Hebrides, doesn't it? The Gulf Stream. They've yeah. all got these little microclimates. Yeah. Cool. Mm. So they grow okay. bananas in Falmouth. Mm. Did you say they go bananas in uh, Falmouth or they grow bananas? What, what, they what grow is bananas in Falmouth, yes. Mm. So you could go bananas as well, I think. 
They well, do a yeah, lot. You can, yes. They, I was going to say they do a lot of you strange things anywhere. They do a lot of strange things in Falmouth, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> nice place. Hey, I sailed out of Falmouth first. Mm hmm. It's a nice place, is Falmouth. But Falmouth Bay, eh? Yeah. Good, good sea, good surf. One of the second largest natural arbors in the world. Yeah. I was reading up about the Netherlands. You know, they're very prone to flooding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, uh, and that they've got this project called the Delta, the Delta Project. The mm -hmm. Delta Programme, which was set up in 2015, because, um, you know, they, they would get completely flooded. That 26% of the land is below sea level. Yeah, not good. Um, oh, the Netherlands is mostly man-made, isn't it? Yeah. yeah they're, they're building dams, storm barriers, yeah. uh, dikes. Tall, uh, taller buildings. Just, <laughs> they're just going all out to protect <laughs> Yeah. Protect the land and the people. Yeah. And it should the, be finished by 2050 is the aim. The people from Venice have been up to see what they're up to because they want yeah. to do the same at Venice as well. Yeah, they're, oh, they're doing some brilliant things. Um, Whether it'll be enough, though, I don't know. Well, they're working at it. They aim to uh, protect one in, uh, they said there should be only about one in a thousand deaths due to flooding. At the moment, it would be a hell of a lot more. So, so what, other than, what are the other 999 then? <laughs> well, they'll be all right. <laughs> that'll, that'll be the atom bomb the we dropped on them. <laughs> yeah. oh, there we've got the boy with the finger in the dike. Absolutely, we? yeah. So hang, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. So what we're talking about, if the population of the Netherlands is like, um, what was it, 10 million people, right? Mm. And one in a thousand dies due to flooding, right? That's quite a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Well, it says um, Netherlands... Isn't there is something like 10,000 people die every year through flooding? Surely that can't be right. Well, the area accommodates 9 million people... Oh, that was a good guess. I said 10. That's yeah. not bad. Yeah. yeah. Not a good so hang on. Hang on, stop a minute. One in a thousand. So that's a lot. Well, they they all people. Oh, it says all people living by a dike are to be protected. Uh, and only one in a thousand deaths would happen due to flooding. Yeah, it's about what, about nine thousand, isn't it? Then total. Yeah. Yeah. If it wasn't for the dike, uh, they'd all be. What they're saying is one death in a thousand is yeah. due to flooding, not in one in one thousand people. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's yeah. one in one thousand deaths. Well, they hope that nobody will drown. Flooding. Yeah, I just so want to know what the other the other nine deaths <laughs> would be due to flooding. <laughs> Yeah, it's what, so like I said, what do the other 999 die from? I want a break. <laughs> yep, you need a break, Carl. Yeah. Uh, For God's sake, how the hell did we get on the dikes? Hey. <laughs> For the boy with his finger in it. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's <laughs> the, the flooding, you see. It's flooding. It's all dirty about flooding. Little, dirty little sod. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, they are doing amazing things in Holland, yeah. which the rest of the world should be following because they know what could happen. Is there any evidence that uh, in the, the Mesolithic that any any people did anything like that eh, around Britain to try and save or the put, land? Put fingers in dikes. Well, yeah, yeah. building causeways or barriers or whatever. Banks and mm. I bet they did. I mean, they built the Cranogs, but we're not sure why. But... Around the broads, they may have done something like that. They yeah. might have done, yeah. Would there be? There wouldn't be any evidence still remaining, would there? Well, it'd be underwater and under mud. There's no reason why not, you know. Mm. So, but uh, well, I mean, they've been doing this in Holland for a long time, but that's really serious now because they can <laughs> see <laughs> Pan panic buying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, most of their industry is in the dodgy area. 
Most right, guys, guys, mm. I'm taking a break. I've had enough of this bloody dikes. No, I do. You just don't like Holland, <laughs> do you? Sorry, the Netherlands is it's not now. Oh, around, shut it? up. Oh, yeah. The low countries. I don't care about the, the bloody low, low countries. Oh, 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 the low countries. That's so imperial. Let <laughs> <laughs> me Flanders. I don't care about it. Oh, yeah, they don't matter. Yeah. <laughs> I read that Scotland is still rising up and the South... That's it, I'm having yeah. a break. According to Nicola Sturgeon, yeah. yeah. Is that- <laughs> oh, Neil Oliver, that'll do. Oh, yeah, yeah, any minute as well, yeah. 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 She's not been uh, too complimentary about our new wonderful Prime Minister, has she? No. <laughs> I think why. No, I don't think they're better friends. To reign over the whole of Britain. She apparently she'd not been in touch with us since she got into power. And you're thinking, oh, that's a bit of a silly one, isn't it? You could have rang up and said, hello, I'm the new prime minister. Yeah. Well, perhaps Nicola Sturgeon should have rung her and congratulated her. And perhaps she didn't. Well, met. they did. No, they did. They or met. Something. They met briefly for a I few minutes that. and that was it. And then she was expecting <laughs> a call and didn't get one. <laughs> But that, that, I've got a few people, other things on her mind, I think. But. <laughs> some people want Nicola Sturgeon to be the leader of the whole of the UK. What? Mm. <laughs> we don't know about that. And she's more of a politician than a lot of the other ones, isn't she? So. Mm. She always looks so cross, doesn't she? She's, it's, it's cold up there. Yeah. <laughs> Angry little Glaswegian lady. Aye. Uh, is. Don't mess. Uh. No, you wouldn't mess with her, would you? No. I always wonder what her husband's like. I'm guessing she's got yeah. one. wonder what he's like, whether he's quiet and shy or whether he's outspoken. I'm sure we'd have heard about him if he was outspoken. Yeah, I've never heard or seen anything of him. No. Uh. Because she has, she has a family, I think, as well, doesn't she? don't really know anything about her private life. No. Yeah. <clears throat> but I believe our mighty leader, Liz, her dad's not talking to her. He's absolutely disgusted because he's an out and out Labour lefty man, isn't he? Well, yeah, she comes from humble upbringing, I think, but so I don't know how she managed to get there. But, uh, but oh, she, she just, she doesn't. I, I find it very difficult because from coming from a film and TV background, she doesn't interview well at all. Oh, she, um, she, she's not a a, a fluid speaker. No. Which is not her fault. That doesn't mean to say she can't speak, and her, but that doesn't come across well. And she 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 delivers speeches like she's reading a a preschool book to five year olds, mm. which doesn't go down well either. <laughs> so she's. I, I'm kind of wondering if they've just left her up. I know they, they've not groomed her at all for the PR side. So I, I'm kind of wondering whether they've deliberately left her up there just to leave her high and dry to fall flat on her face. But, mm. But it's rather sad. Somebody said on, I think, the radio today, or it might have been the television, that you know we've we've had a a couple of years of problems within government and parliament simply because of the infighting that's going on with the Conservative Party, mm. which they need to sort out. But mm. as a result, we've not had very much guidance and direction as as a country. Chaos, you know? absolute chaos. Yeah, which is not good. So. No. No, it's very scary. And also what's not good is there have been a golden opportunity there for other parties to step in and take over and take <laughs> advantage. But they haven't, have they? So we're thinking they can't be much better, sadly, either. Uh, well, they've moved in the direction of the similar, yeah. the similar values. So yeah. yeah, gone too central, yeah. That's right. So there isn't much difference there. Yeah. That's funny how it swings around, isn't it? Because that's how Tony Blair got into power, wasn't it? By going back from the left into the centre to get the centre vote. Yeah. And now it's backfired. You know, so. yeah. Now we've got the right wing loonies. That, and that's what that was one of their own people called them that. <laughs> Just thought, I saw a, a thing today with a bit of a, a YouTuber. With, what's his name? The leader of um, Wales. 
Oh, yeah. Which was simply. Mm. And some Tory was moaning about what was happening in the ambulances, you know, in, in yeah. the Welsh. Uh, yeah. And he wouldn't leave it alone. And <laughs> the, I forgot his name is, I should know. Mark Drayford. Yeah. That's Mark Drayford. Yeah. He ap was ap apoplexic about it. How mm. dare you, you know, and he, he caught yeah. really what his government had done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the, the ambulance was their fault. <laughs> How dare he come and... But was, they, that's what they're doing, though, isn't it? They're blaming it on everything else. Yeah. You're thinking, wait a minute, you've been in power for over 10 years now. You can't blame everybody well, the else. The problem is... <laughs> We need more money for our 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 the public services like the NHS yeah. and other things. Yeah. And to get that, we need to pay a little more tax. <gasps> a penny on tax. Yeah, a penny <laughs> on income <laughs> tax for everybody yeah. would raise sufficient money to make them viable. Didn't you not remember Liberal because Democrats said that about? Most 15 people. years ago, and it was got chucked out. Yeah. Well, yes. People don't want to pay taxes, and they want well, the services that they don't that get the connection. Most no. people don't get the connection, do they, between no. to pay taxes no. to get the services. They want no. both. No I, blame it. I blame it on teachers. Pardon? <laughs> I blame it on teachers. <laughs> All those teachers. <laughs> How, how do they not know? You're right. You're absolutely right. They just do not connect the two things together. The two, yeah. and in in Europe, in Europe, they do. They they yep. happily pay more. Not maybe not happily, mm. but they pay more taxes, a lot yeah. more taxes. They so they've got better services. But you yeah. see, our, our, our culture has told them that taxes are a bad thing. It's much better. Uh, I wonder where they got that from. And I think, and yeah. I think <laughs> most people believe it. Unfortunately. Yeah. Why don't they lift the tax threshold so you don't start paying income tax until you're earning about £18,000? Yeah, that would be a lot fairer, wouldn't it? And then you wouldn't have to pay any, that. wouldn't pay anywhere near as much um, income support then either. Yeah. But, uh, that they would nearly get me out of tax. Yeah, I was going to say that's the problem is that uh, there are a large majority of the working people are in that bracket. So they wouldn't they wouldn't pay anything. No. So they wouldn't get any tax. I get annoyed at my old age pension being fully taxed. Oh, that's wrong. You've already paid for that. Are you going oh, yes. to lose the, you're going to lose the trip a lot soon as well. That's I think yeah. under it. Oh, and, they, and they wouldn't be able to pay the uh, the the, the, the <laughs> reduce the taxes on the higher threshold if they didn't tax the, the poor people. So Mm -hmm. oh, but I, I think a penny on standard tax. Yeah, I, I would have enough pay. money to. Yeah, I, I'd rather have I'd rather have progressive taxing, not not mm. lower on for everybody. It doesn't help most of the poor people. No, it doesn't. You ne we need mm. progressive taxation mm. so that they don't pay anything or hardly no hardly anything, and and the people have got more pay. A higher yeah. proportion. Yeah, well, that's how it should be. <laughs> and also, also those companies that register outside the country and have oh, yeah, shops on the high that. street. Yeah, that lot paying. So, yeah. uh, it amazes me how Nun they'll go guns. after. They'll go after the sort of like three or four thousand of the sort of the private individual, but millions they won't bother with. You know. Yeah. Well, is there a mate, bunny? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we put the world to rights between us. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, we'd be we'd be what all to put us in charge, wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we know. Well, my daughter said it's just the same in Spain. Yeah. Um, mm. their energy bills because it's because of the war isn't it oh well, yeah why our energy bills are going up which is at the bottom of nearly everything isn't it yeah it affects all the businesses it's affecting everything but she said of course it's still boiling hot over there so they don't need yeah the heat. They don't need the heating but when I, when I was in turkey though the, the price of the petrol pump was mm. the high the highest price was a hundred and uh was uh, one one about one twenty was that their most expensive, In and we door. we were at one ninety then. And you're thinking, well, that, how was that? How because you know, it would be cheaper to go and fill a petrol tanker up on the forecourt and bring it back 
yeah. and pay what we are paying. And you're thinking, well, that can't be right. There's something wrong there. You know. Well, in Mallorca, it's about the same as it is here. Wow, that's yeah. a lot. That's it's a lot uh, for Spain. Yeah, it is. Yeah, mm. it depends which area of Spain you're in. Mm. He's mm. on an island, so a lot of things are imported. Yeah. But um, they're having it just the same there, but not not quite to the same extent. No. But they're laughing at our politicians. I think everybody's yeah. laughing at them. <laughs> Over there, with, with it's just a joke. <laughs> Boris was especially. It's put put spitting image out of a job, isn't it? Because they're doing oh, it for real. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. I've just noticed your little men on the wall, Andy. Hey. Little... Little paper then. Oh, the, <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm in the uh, I'm in the dining room at the moment because the oh, uh, we've got <laughs> the, uh, we've got a, a new boiler going in, so we had no heating last night, but they've really? left some heating tonight. But so my my little utility room where my office is is completely gutted at the moment. So oh, were you at the little men? <laughs> yes. Are you having one of these new kind of boilers? No, it's just a, a, st a standard boiler. Yeah. So. I don't know that these new ones have been tried and tested properly yet, have they? I don't know because we've oh, rented. Talking about rent the heat pump. Pump. Course, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this this is that the landlord just wanted a standard, ordinary one, so that's what oh, we got. Right. They're simply compressing air, and as they compress air, so they build up heat. Mm. Mm. Are they going to go ahead with the fracking again? They're trying to. Ooh. It, it, I don't and all the others I know it's on Liz Truss's idea. It was a good idea. Yeah. 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 One of, another one of our great ideas. Yeah. There's an awful lot of uh, legislation that's being pushed through at the moment through Parliament as a result of Brexit. Um, oh. you know, yeah. Well, it's the um, all the um, hygiene ones, the safety regulations, the building regulations, all these things are all tied into European away. stuff and they're all being thrown out. Yeah. All being dropped, yeah. Yeah. So you know, um, the, yeah, we have those restrictions on exporting live animals and all the rest of it. That's all going. So it's, uh, it's dreadful, really. All, it, it is. Yeah. yeah red tape, uh, and they use it protections for health and all sorts. It, of stuff. it is, and also because they're doing it so quickly, there'll be holes and problems that are going to cause endless legislate, uh, you know, litigation later yeah. on for all sorts of things, and that is. Well, aren't we getting la uh, sheep, lambs, etc., from Australia and New Zealand? Well, they're talking about getting those well, those big ones. Yeah. Well, we always have, haven't we? Uh, always yeah. New Zealand. Yeah, but they've signed some kind no, of new not league. live, not live ones. Yeah, well, probably not. No. Yeah, there's some big, big sheep or something. I think they're about the size of a cow, aren't they? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know they don't follow the same. Well, you want the feeding them on? That's a bit weird. That we probably wouldn't want to know. Oh yeah, we probably have to grow <laughs> that and all. Make yeah. grow big. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know. Well, I do like me Welsh lamb. Oh, yep. really? Yeah, takes yeah. a bit of beating. It does, oh, yeah. 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 We have the uh, salt marsh up here, salt marsh lamb, but I it's got a quite a different flavour, but I actually don't like it as much as like the Welsh. Oh, uh, but uh, the, the, the Gower, we have the salt. Yeah. Salt marsh fed lamb, and they, they, they've got a different flavour in there. Very yeah. Nice. yeah. Out on a platinum island, we had uh, soeys, mm. and uh, the, uh, the the black Welsh black ram got amongst the soeys, which were all females, yeah. and so we had soey lamb, which is a wild a wild sheep, and the, mm. the the lambs were much smaller, much yeah. Uh, le less fat, but much, you know. Yeah. That way, they were quite nice. So I have one of the carcasses myself. I've never tried. And uh, sure. they, they ride it up amongst the family, and that was very nice to eat, but entirely different. Because you mm. get those Hebridean sheep as well. That are, they're very little as well, aren't they? Well, that's so, the same. Yeah. That, well, that's why the Soviets yeah, are. I thought, that, that yeah, I thought they might yeah. be. Yeah. 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 How many yeah. horns have they got? They have horns, yeah. No, do they have ones, yeah. Because uh, the Hebrideans have two sets, like one that sticks up and then one lot that goes out oh, to the side. Oh, They're kind of weird. The, Handlebars. They, <laughs> they, they only had the two horns, that we, right. the ones that we've had on the island, yeah. Mm. There won't be a lot of meat got any vegetarians here, Right, it? let's crack on. I'm a vegetarian, so shut up. All right. right. 
All um, sheep are vegetarians. Yeah. I tell you what, vegetarian <laughs> people are, are, are like very, um, are very annoying and obstreperous. Yes, they are. And, yes, and, you're you know, right. They've got a bit of attitude. From where they? Oh, there you go. I thought I'd, I, 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 hopefully, I thought I'd lost you all. You know, it wouldn't be a great loss. Right. Okay, then crack on. No, but before you say what's on my head, Pete, shut up. We're coming back to Samson Island now, are we? Right. No, what we're going to do is is that um, we're going to do something unusual now. I've got some I've got some nice stuff. Um, and actually, we're going to go to Guernsey after this. We're going to finish on Guernsey. Because because what I wanted to do, um, I, I just thought, oh, this is a this is a great little comparison, isn't it? So I can do I could do a little bit of comparison stuff. So that, I that, that, those that, photographs that's... of Ramsey with the the fogu and the uh, and, and the the roundhouse that they built from that was Jersey, Pete. Jersey, sorry, yes. Yeah, well, we'll do that when we do the Neolithic stuff, right? So yeah, anyway, okay. crack on. Pete, let me do the talk and shut up. Do you know what? I've got great respect for everyone other than Andy, Margaret, um, Drina. Um, but I, I do respect what David, shut up you. I do respect what David and uh, Anne says. <laughs> right, track on. Right, first of all, I'm gonna, I want to chuck a, ma a map, okay? So, uh, oh. I, hey, I tell you what, Margaret, you and I are getting getting into nether regions for these maps, aren't we? <laughs> nether regions. <laughs> there, there it is. And i got to be honest with you, we're not doing Sam, Samson Island, right? That's Samson of Dole, not Samson, which you are, Peter. It's completely yeah. the different spelling. Only, it's only missing a P. Well, I tell you what, right, Peter, right, if you want this discussion, right, there's Lord Longford, who's an absolute loon, right? I'm a Langford. Is a big difference. Well, we're both loons. Right? <laughs> so what it, what it is, right, what it is, I, there's there's a little bit of information I want us to do on Jersey, right? Not on the Guernsey, Guernsey. Um, and it, it uses some of the terms that I've been using. So that's really, really useful for us. Now, I've got this little piece that's from a research agenda that, that looks at sort of silly uh, being quite unique. So I want us to, I want us to look at that. Um, and then I want, it, it, there's got one here that talks about the microliths, again, being um, a unique thing that we get from the silly islands. And what this does, it mentions these little bits of islands separately, right? So, um, I want us to do that. I'm not going to be able to do all of that, um, but there's some really nice facts. So let's just sort of do some of the archaeology first. And again, the other reason why I want to do this is because when we do when we do the Neolithic and when we do sort of the Bronze Age and the Iron Age within these islands, you, you, you're very well aware of the facts. So here we go. So, so this is the thing. Um, once Britain had become separated from European mainland um, in the 800s, Mesolithic stone tool traditions on the opposite sides of the newly formed channel embarked upon different directions of development. And this is what we find. This is what we find. Um, the, then we, we contradict that because we say that the microliths, that the Mesolithic stuff that we find on the Sealy Islands, is similar to that Europe that we've been disconnected from. So let, let's try and equate that. So the material culture, the stuff that we're finding associated with the Mesolithic period in Britain, then becomes um, at the end, going into the Neolithic period, very different from in Europe because there's not really that great link anymore. However, because there's no land bridge, but however, on the, the Isles of Scilly, um, hence the discovery of late Mesolithic microliths of apparently Belgium in uh, affinity at the western extreme of, the, uh, of, of southern Britain, the Scilly Islands, comes as something as a surprise. Now, we didn't mention that word surprise, but I wanted to mention it now. Um, and it sort of, it really sort of 
aids us to understand that there's a lot more to the picture than meets the eye. Now, that leads us ni nicely onto Nab's Head, does it not? In West Wales, where we've got Nab's Head, that sort of, um, that Mesolithic site. And we basically said, oh, there, there's a factory there. He used the word factory earlier on in regards to the Scilly Islands. Nice. But we, we've got a factory of lithic trading um, that, you know, we've got all this lithic evidence. 40,000 bits of broken off flint and shirt on Nab's head, indicating that all the, all the things that they produce had been traded elsewhere. Um, and that would have been via water. So that's part of the land in West Wales. But this is an island, so there's no reason to say that these people didn't trade. There is little doubt that the small lithic lithic assemblages from the Isle of Wight, uh, Isle of Scilly, is totally different to that from any other um, Mesolithic site in Britain. It's very different. And there's not just one or two flints, there's lots of them. Um, and it's sort of typically of that type of Europe, including the Netherlands. Typologically, the ma majority of what we are finding would be nicely at home in Northern Europe. Um, and again, what, what, what we do see is that with this combination of this evidence tells us that they are clearly trade items that have made it its way to the Isle of Scilly, right? Um, you know, Pete, Peter said something earlier on, maybe, maybe these little fragments of microliths uh, were from objects that were being created and made on the Scilly Islands. Well, these little microliths are actually the final object which have been broken off a bigger, bigger object. So that they could have been sort of, they could have been similar to the stuff in France and Belgium, and they could have been made here. But whatever I'm saying, whatever Pete said, or whatever, the main thing is, it is that they're being influenced as an influence. Somehow these people are being influenced by what's going on in Europe. Wherever the material is coming from, let's leave that there, they're being influenced. So that's a really, really important point. Now, the other nitty gritty of this is to look at this other little thing. Now, I had to go on the, I, I had to go on uh, the, uh, the silly, at the Scilly Islands government website, right? And they've got some really good information about the islands. Naturally, it is good information, right? So there are 200 islands altogether, mainly bits of rock sticking out. Well, there we go. Today, only five of the islands are inhabited. Five, there's probably one, of the, one or two of the other little ones, are, but not really inhabited by too many people. So. Um, so you've got, um, you know, what's described as St. Mary's, uh, St. Mary's would be described as the, um, um, as the mainland, right? Have I explained this with Orkney? Well, Orkney, right? The mainland in Orkney is the main island in Orkney, right? Not mainland Scotland. So the mainland for Scilly Islands is St. Mary's there. So it's the biggest one. Um, and all the other ones off islands, such as St. Agnes, such as Briar, such as St. Martins. And we've missed one out, haven't we, uh, Peter? Tresco. Tresco. But when we, when we go to look at the islands in the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, um, and later periods, more of those islands are still inhabited. I think it's like a modern phenomenon. So the archipelago contains wide expanses of shallow subtidal and intertidal environments. So some revealed, some unrevealed, low water levels and so on. But obviously what we've got is a gateway of geological um, change. Now this, this might help us out with a bit of geology from the mainland and the islands as well. The Isles of, the Isles of Scilly are situated um, at the merging of, of the Western approaches and the English and Bristol channels. So Pete's point about this is where all the waters meet. Yeah, he's, he's nailed it. 
the area forms part of the wide continental shelf. We mentioned that. Um, and the rocks at seabed are resistant, metamorphosized, and basically these things that are sticking out now are the geological lids of granite, uh, all those types of similar materials that you actually see uh, in regards to the mainland. So all that good stuff. Now, to give you an idea of, of I, I've got, it's wonderful. This, this website is great actually, uh, because it gives, it gives um, idea. St. Mary's itself has an area of 629 hectares. Um, so if you times that to, by two and a half, you get acres. It's not a massive area, mind. That's not a massive area. Um, and although rarely rising more than 30 metres above sea level, that's the highest point, 30 metres above sea level. There is one or two places that are a little bit higher than that, uh, just coming up to 50 metres above sea level. So what I'm not going to do is go into all the details about all these islands. But what we what we do do uh, is we talk about St. Mary's uh, and we'll do this for Peter with Tresco. Right, we'll do a little bit more of the history of the Scilly Islands and then we'll call Scilly Islands a day. And then we're just going to link the Guer Guernsey Island with it. So St. Mary's is the largest of the islands, as we've already mentioned. It, it's four kilometres in length by 2.8 kilometres wide. Relatively flat island. Uh, there are features that stick out. It's got rising from a low rocky coastline. The interior of the island is gently undulated and includes a rounded plateau um, and there's an airport there as well it's got low moors and it's got high moors so very similar to salt, salt and some of the main land um, environment but I should interject here at this stage when you're thinking about the Mesolithic period this this would have been like a hill right this would have just been this beginning hill um, and you're thinking well this is the great debate where did people live in the Mesolithic period I really struggle to find evidence of settlements. There's one or two bits of evidence of settlements um, indicated for the Mesolithic period, but not much. It's mainly in, the, in regards to lithics and nothing really set in stone, as it were. And so you're thinking that maybe the evidence is between those islands and where people lived, or maybe I'm wrong. So this, this Tresco as well. Uh, Tresco essentially comprised uh, three low rounded hills uh, with, uh, separated by little valleys uh, and the highest point castle down is 44 meters high um, and again here we go this is the point that peter made abbey hill the subtropical tresco abbey gardens sheltered in the lee of abbey hill the southern part of the islands between um, this landscape um, contains a low-lying area of blown sand, so the sand dunes. But that point that we got this sort of, it's interesting again, if we, if we re-equate ourselves with the language that was used there, the southern part of the island uh, between Apple Tree Bay and um, Pentel Bay comprises a flat, low-lying area of blown sand. And above that, uh, here we go, the subtropical Tresco Abbey Gardens shelter in the lee of Abbey Hill. So if we want to interpret that and, and roll that out in other parts of the country, we might be able to think that there might have been one little dell or whatever um, across little bits of Britain that may have been inhabit that may have been habitable in the depths and the worst of the Paleolithic period. So people didn't need to resign in those damnable um, Caves, for example, that, that we that we know are quite dominant in the Paleolithic Mesolithic period. So what, what I'd like to do now is obviously what, what I would like to think about um, is that I'd like to give you one or two little facts to do with the archaeology. And this would, this would be interesting for us all. And this is quite stark. So here we go. Antiquarians and archaeologists, we don't usually do this, but we are. The study of the historical environment of, of Scilly was pioneered by the famous antiquarian uh, Borlase. Um, and Borlase, William Borlase, 
lived within, within a parish near Penzance. He visited the Scilly Islands in 1752, and he was the first to recognise the importance of the archaeology on the Scilly Islands. So that was in 1752. And Borlase, I've mentioned him before a number of times. Um, and slowly, bit by bit, throughout the um, 17, 1800s, um, there, uh, there is 12 known archaeological excavations of the archaeology of the Scilly Islands, um, mainly to do with graves and mounds and so on. Um, and people are writing lots of books about them. A certain a Reverend John uh, Troutbeck um, is on, on the Scilly Islands. He's, he's writing in 1794 uh, about the archaeology of the Scilly Islands. Um, and, and when we think about the Scilly Islands, it's being pursued as an archaeological resource, and there's lots out there. So when we, when we actually look at the Scilly Islands as a place that's been studied extensively, we've got a lot to look at uh, in the future when we come back to the Scilly Islands. So what I'd like to do finally today is I'd like to go over to Guernsey. Um, and we'll, we, we can answer sort of, we, we did do Jersey uh, a few weeks ago. We just want to do Guernsey now. And, and then why have I jumped into Guernsey? Simply because it answers some questions that we have in regards to islands. Now, one or two of the names to do with this piece in front of me um, is a Tim Scandal Hall, who was actually responsible for some of the work in regards to um, um, oh god, what was that book that we did the other week that um, Margaret wanted to get, or was it Drina? Anyway, oh Drina, it was you, wasn't it? Um, they they were responsible for writing that part of that book. Uh, and also Chantal Collier. So these people are actually looking into this stuff. So what they're saying is that um, the, there are new insights now into human responses to and perceptions of sea level rise at a time when the landscape of Northwestern Europe is rapidly changing. These issues are investigated when people have looked at the Channel Islands in particular particularly on Jersey and Guernsey, the Lee Howe site in Guernsey. Um, and it's said that we argue that people were drawn to this area as a revolt, a result of the dynamic environmental processes occurring and the opportunities these created. So there was a point somebody made earlier on, if you want to switch this over to Cis, um, the Scilly Islands. Um, Pete said there must have been a reason why they went to the Scilly Islands, and he's right. Um, as people went to the Isle of Man, uh, people went to Guernsey and Alderney and, and all those other islands. What we're trying to say is that people were, were, were radiating to these islands um, before they became islands and after they became islands. That's a really important point. So the evidence suggests, for example, the evidence suggests, for example, um, that these islands themselves were very much linked to Northern France. And I remember saying that before. And in many ways, these people in Northern France uh, are linked very much to the people on the Channel Islands. And just this point I'd like to make is the drowning of Doggerland and the Channel Plain, interesting enough, and we're gonna chuck in um, Linus Plain between um, Cornwall and, and the islands themselves. Um, has been, is slowly starting to be the focus of study. Um, and, and the reason, the other reason why people are really starting to study these areas is because of the present point in time. How did people change? How did people react? How can we learn from these changes and reactions? This is why people are actually studying these landscapes. And this idea that uh, the current uncertainties over the rate and the timing of inundations is of great concern to us and something that we want to study today to help us understand um, the modern condition and how we move on. So, you know, um, 
just a few other points about these these Channel Islands again. Um, so the Mesolithic period, we are starting to find preserved archaeology on the likes of Guernsey from the Paleolithic period and the Mesolithic period. Um, and this is this is an archaeology that seems to be spread in those upland areas and maybe those low lying areas as well as they've been excavating on Guernsey and as they've been excavating on Jersey. And it's that to get a chronology of occupation uh, that is occurring before and after these islands at the Channel Islands become said islands. So people are living there before and people are living there after. So I just like to just say that, um, you know, the experience of these islands is very different from mainland Britain's experience. Uh, and we've got to go on to sort of understand that into the Neolithic period, because when we go into the Neolithic period now, things are going to be very different in lots of different areas. And those those differences in lots of different areas are borne out by the human condition and what's going on um, in the Mesolithic period. And one thing that you will find, one thing that we didn't do much on, but we did mention it, was the Orkney Islands. When we look at the Orkney Islands, we're going to have a lot to look at, and you'll start to understand why Orkney archaeology develops in a very different way as the archaeology of the Sissy um, Silly Islands develops in a very different way, and as the archaeology of the Channel Islands and all these other islands develop. Everything has got a uniqueness, um, and it's called determinism. That word to end with today, determinism. Uh, you determine your your values and your landscape and your humanity by what you've got around you, not necessarily influenced from outside. Silly Islands, influence from outside. Channel Islands, influence from outside. But after a certain while, those influences from outside get lesser and lesser and lesser. And you've got to evolve your own path in life. That's called determinism. So on that note, uh, next week, we will be dabbling with the Neolithic period. Little few loose ends from the Mesolithic period. And what we're going to do is, are there any questions? And there we go. If we, we look at those there, that's some of the artifacts from the Silly Islands. And, um, um, and, and actually, if we, if we type in um, Silly um, Islands Mesolithic artifacts, I think we'll be able to get a few more images before we finish. <coughs> uh, there. Hang on, let's just see what we've got. See if any of these comes up. Images. Um, well, these are some of the other archaeology. Um, uh, I'm saying that's Scottish over there. If there's any other stuff, it just seems to be those flints. So we are very limited by some of the images, just sort of images of, of, of how we develop here. Uh, but again, just sort of um, the microliths there, sort of typical microliths. Um, again, this sort of difference with these ones on the left, with those ones on the right, as we said earlier on. Um, um, I think these these are more down the south. These ones on the on the left here. So obviously, as we sort of develop into the mess, um, the Neolithic period, things start to change. Again, this this type of object, um, this little object here that is actually from um, the Nessa Brodga, which it, which is actually on Orkney. That's the type of thing you might find there. Um, Again, differences in artifacts in different areas. So things are already becoming different as things really evolve into the different worlds that we see in the Neolithic. So that's a good way to finish. So let's sort of finish that now. And let's sort of look at that there and let's that stop. Right, so are there any questions, Margaret? Well, just since we started the lectures about the Mesolithic, it was mostly about 8,000 years ago. 
And we seem to have gone back now 12, possibly even 14,000 years ago. And that's a huge difference. That's four to 6,000 years longer than we originally thought. And we've gone from them being hunter gatherers to possibly being more settled. So everything's gone upside down, isn't it? So, so if I can reinterpret what you're saying, so, um, so we might be starting the Mesolithic period a lot earlier, um, mm. and we're ending the Mesolithic in the in sort of, you know, eight thousand years ago. Um, but some people bold the cliff; they're starting to say the Mesolithic ended eight thousand five hundred years ago. Um, so there's lots of this is what the evidence is telling us: big changes. You're very right, Margaret. But, um, and, and, and also. Oh, sorry, the Cheddar Man that they reckon was about 10,000 years old. We refer to him as the, in the Paleolithic. Yes, and, but we, we, then, we then started to say, right, he's, he's in the Mesolithic. So, so, so you are right in making these observations. What we're trying to say is that as we've been doing this, there's been an evolution with how we interpret the Mesolithic period. Hmm. Uh, and, and that that is quite useful, Margaret, because we're learning, we're seeing that there are changes. And with more, I tell you what, right, uh, Margaret, you could never have imagined those footprints being found on the 31st of May, 2022. I know. <laughs> it's astounding, isn't it? You know, we did that in our lectures. We, we were, it happened. Hmm. It yeah, happened. I'm wondering if, if people were living during the glacial period, which we're thinking possibly they did here. In communities, uh, yes. Yeah, would, would they have lived like the um, Inuit, the Eskimos in ice buildings? Oh, actually, actually, Margaret, right? You've actually said something that we haven't even covered. Um, you, you've actually made, you made a presumption there you, you've made a really good presumption and, and uh, what you have said, you've said, um, let's read between the lines here, you've said, okay, um, they, some people live in caves, some people live in, in sort of microclimates and, you know, little communities. And then you're saying, actually, you can have people living on the ice as Inuits, right? We don't even think about that. We don't even discuss that. We don't even go there, right? And why not? Well, it's possible if... Um, no, no, let's, let's not do possible. It happens today, so why not then? Well, yeah, yeah. You think it might not have been less likely to happen then because there were less people and they could sort of move more easily. But what we are finding is there's more, there's more people then than we thought there was. But what you're saying is obviously there are less people then. Um, but there's more people then that we now know about than if we did this two years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, we were still that, attached to the continent then, weren't we? So that it was covered a, a much bigger area. It wasn't just UK, it was your, it was a whole continent. And if you were in US and you were moving, you wouldn't have had trees or anything like that to deal with. You could have just gone over there. And there, there were woolly mammoth. There were quite a lot of animals coming across, weren't there? It's such a comp. What what we've tried what we've tried to do by looking at the Mesolithic period is to just what what I've done is the right thing. I've said there's a beginning and there's an end, right? So you you've got an end sometime between eight thousand five hundred and eight thousand years ago, and the words that we spelt out by by the work from Bradford University was, was basically the Mesolithic ended um, a lot earlier than we thought. That's what they said at Boulder Cliff. And they also said um, that the Neolithic has arrived. It was like emerging, wasn't it? The whole time it's just been... Uh, what's the word that we, we've used? We've used the word transition. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, well done, Margaret. I, if everyone's taken everything on board, um, um, like, well, put it this way, if you've just taken that on board and that's all you've taken up on board, um, that's a massive amount to learn because you can stand up in your own thing and say, this is what this is. Um, so that's a good thing. Anything else, Margaret? No. Nope. I'm impressed. Now, Drina has to impress me. <laughs> I'm awfully sorry. No questions. 
Oh, well, what about building the places with whale bones and skin? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Like, like OK. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yes. So in other words, that, that's going to be your Inuit houses, your people moving around and so on. And I, I would say that, um, right, do you know what? Do you know what, Trina, I need this discussion with you now, right? Um, this morning, it was this morning, and I thought, right, um, if, if I invited a load of people here and said, right, there's, those, there's the materials, build a house, right? It, it's doable. It can be done because that's what people did in the past, right? So... Um, the, the point being is that you you build what you can with the resources around you, right? Uh, and it doesn't take much to build a house. Uh, if you've got enough materials, you just you just put the whole thing together. People need shelter, right? And you will find shelter. You will make shelter. There are ways of doing it. Um, and yeah, you're, you're right in what you're saying. Any materials left on the... Right. Uh, Drina, a, a house made out of timber is because there's timber for them to make a house out of. Yeah. Uh, making a house out of whale bones means that there's whale bones around to make the house. Yeah. It's, it's the same process. There's no difference. Yeah. God, we're, we're really getting through this today. Right. Who's next? I'm glad you've answered that, Drina. Who's next? Um, Annie Panny. She can't. She, I tell you what, guys, if she doesn't say anything, she's banned from these classes. Right, <laughs> Annie. <laughs> I don't know. I'm quite, I've got quite a, thing, a lot of things going around. I'm thinking with the changing of the, the, the waters gradually, it must have happened very slowly, mustn't it? Um, you know, the, 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 so much of it got flooded. And, and then the difference in the climate. And I'm wondering how the people moved at that time. You know, if, if they were suddenly found themselves marooned or, or, or had to sort of um, learn to move on water just because they, it overtook them or whether they'd have plenty of time to, to or they would have known it before they got there. You know, I, I just think the whole thing seems to be shifting around people. And they've I, got I... that. I think everything you said is right, but there is one thing, one thing in that sort of halfway through what you were saying. Um, it, it, it's about, it's about like, okay, um, there, there's, there's water over there, right? Yeah. Um, how, how, do, how do we go between here and there? Mm -hmm. We're going to have to make a vessel to get from here to there. It's the same as building our house with Drina, right? Um, you use the materials that you've got, yes. um, and the other thing as well is if you want to die, Anne, right, you can bloody drown, right? But if you want to live, you're going to build something. And that, that's the answer. Yes, but then probably if, if they had, hadn't made it before, I mean, they'd perhaps have to start, you know, if you start, everything can be made and everything has been made, but it, the first time it might fail. In fact, you might lose right. life just because you don't know how to do it, but you'd get better at it. Or somebody who survives does at least. <laughs> Uh, well, that, exactly. The person who survived has managed to escape. That's the answer. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the other <laughs> thing as well is Thor Heyerdahl on Contiki in 1951, right? He was he was able to make um, a raft That's basically true. based on designs from Egypt or whatever, right? But he, he managed to go uh, across a large expanse in all sorts of weathers, right? But he did it. Yeah. Well... Well, that that that's basically it, then, isn't it? If he can bloody do it, and we, we and he's and he's not living, he's not living that life all the time. But these people live that life all the time. They they would have been better than Thor Heyerdahl, with all great respect to the guy. Where there's all a Thor, that's a way. All Thor Heyerdahl was doing was was trying to replicate something. These people were living amongst it. <laughs> Margaret, I'm just saying, where there's a will, there's a way, isn't there? Exactly. Exactly. Do you think they'd have boats anyway, living near the sea or by a river? Well, yeah, I, I would say they would do because that was their main transport. But um, yeah. carts with wheels. Well, what, what are you going to do with them? Then there's many many roads, is it? 
you 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 try you try and uh, move a cart with wooden wheels across a muddy field. You're not going to get you're not going to get anywhere. No. And also, also, you can't move carts through a solid woodland, but you can move a boat through, along a stream. Right. Okay. Um, right. Who else have we got? Uh, Andy. No. Nope. David's waiting to go. We'll leave him to the last just to wind him up. Right, no. Andy. No, I'm happy. I just go then. Thank you. Oh no, don't go, Dave. Bye, Stay Dave, there, everybody. Peter. Bye. <laughs> bye, bye. Oh, good. Hey, see you, Dave. David. I'll see you next week. See you, Dave. Yeah. Bye, Dave. Oh my yeah. God, have I upset him? Yeah, you triggered him off. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, Andy, anything you want to say, darling? No, no, that's, that's really interesting. And uh, some good comments coming out from the end here, all different aspects of possibilities. I, I, I like it. I like yeah. it. This, this yeah, is good. Good. Um, I don't think Pete's going to be as, as good as everybody else, but he's done it all, I think. So, uh, Pete. Well, are you talking of Inuits? Inuits. I was in uh, Port Churchill, Manitoba, loading grain on a ship. The port is only open for three months of the year. Mm. And the uh, the local uh, Inuits who lived in the what looked to be ramshackle wooden buildings. <coughs> and they would be there all through the winter under uh, ice and snow. Mm. The American theater there was called the Igloo Theater because it was under it was under ice and snow during the winter. Yeah. And uh, like, like I said, it was only open for a very short period. And those Inuit houses, they look quite, to me, they look quite fragile. But they obviously lived in them through the, the ice and snow of the winter, down to minus 40 and things like that. God. But, I believe those igloos are quite snug yeah. inside. Yeah. But coming well, back to St. Mary's, quite well out, Margaret. Well, coming back to St. Mary's, we paid for a, yeah, a coach trip around St. Mary's. We paid Vic and his old Bedford bus for a coach trip around St. Mary's. And it was quite an experience. And we get in this coach and he's on, on going down the road. He said, this is the A13. This is St. Mary's answer to the M4. <laughs> <laughs> and he was going along a bit. And there's Mrs. Mrs. So-and-so with her car. And she's actually been known to reverse. <laughs> <laughs> we're, coming, we're coming past, oh, there's Harold Wilson's bungalow. Uh, the flag's not flying, so it looks like he's not in attendance yet. But we have to thank Mr. Uh, Mr. Al Wilson because he brought car tax to the island. <laughs> and well, it, for, with 13 miles, it took an hour in this coach to go <laughs> around St. Mary's. And it was a, it was a treat. It was. Yeah. No, you went nowhere, saw nothing, but it was a treat. Yeah. <laughs> you saw the sea? You saw the sea. You certainly did see the sea, yep. Yeah. You joined the Navy. What did we see? What did we mm -hmm. see? We saw the sea. But uh, that, that trip to, uh, Port, uh, to Port Churchill in, per in the uh, Hudson Bay was, was quite something to mm. be in that sort of area where, uh, like I say, it was only open for three months of the year. And the rest of it, you couldn't get into the Hudson Bay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and the, the uh, our bar, the bar there, was the Hudson Bay Fur Trading Company, with, with a note above the bar saying, "Don't sell liquor to the Indians." Oh. <laughs> by, 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 the, by the way, we got we got we got three people watching online. We got one who says, uh, "Good evening, looking sexy, Pete." <laughs> So, so so Pete's got Pete's got a stalker online. Yeah. <laughs> so so oh my god. So so Pete, you you're famous. Almost as famous as you. Yeah, but but you, you get you get comments like you're looking sexy, Pete. So you know, I, I just yeah, you're in. Yeah, you know, I, I just I I know the Fair woman enough. who made that comment. I know the woman who made that comment, Pete. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, 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 oh my god, there's four people watching online now. Steady, steady. <laughs> oh god. That's because they know it's going to finish. 
Oh, oh yeah, uh, Andy, Andy, that's really good, right? I was just about to say, hi guys on YouTube. Don't forget to like and subscribe. There's four of you. We're just about to finish. Wow. Right, here we go. What we're going to say is give the people on YouTube an opportunity to say something. Does yeah. anyone on YouTube want to say something, right? If you want to, you can go and say something in the chat box. There's five people watching now. Oh, wow. hey, hey. Thank goodness I'm sitting down. <laughs> oh, my God. Thank goodness. Hey, hey, I tell you, I tell you what, right? What we're going to do, if anyone wants to say anything on on. On YouTube now, has to say it now. They've got to say it now, this minute. Yeah, I, I got to listen. Right. If they're not going to say anything, miserable sods. Oh, I, I don't say that. Oh, oh, yeah. They're probably all. Oh, one of them's already gone. Oh, I see. They didn't realize they'd left it on by mistake. Yeah. I've lost one of my audience now. I'm reading a book, by the way. Ooh. Oh, yeah, I didn't oh. think you could read. Yeah, well, I've just learned. It's called Islands of Abandonment, Life in the Post-Human Landscape. Ooh. Ooh. Oh. It's, it's really interesting. Is that out of our library or is that one you No, oh. no, this is from Armside Library, not Ooh. our... Ooh. Oh, really? Not wow. our Archaeology Cymru Library. I didn't know they had any books in there. Yeah, it, and it's saying about... Do you remember Bikini Atoll? I do. Yeah. Where they detonated the nuclear bombs. Oh, Small nasty but stuff. devastating. 1940s yeah. and 50s. Yeah. Uh, they did a massive test in 1954. Bigger... 7,000 times the force of that dropped on Hiroshima were wow. detonated. And uh, the whole place uh, was a no-go area. But back in 2008, an international team of researchers returned to inspect it. And there's a thriving underwater ecosystem that has formed in the blast crater over the intervening decades. So life has returned. With two-headed fish. Amazing. Well, then what's wrong with the two-headed fish? You're just being racist there, Andy. It's twice as much to eat. Yeah. Shut up. It says the waters of the lagoon, lagoon flash boiled as temperatures rose to 55,000 degrees centigrade. Wow. So it's amazing that there's anything living there now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So it just shows that... Uh, is, is, is that the terminology for fast food? What? You said I'm, flash I'm boiled. Putin is playing with these. Flash boiling, yeah. Flash boiling. Yeah. yeah. Oh, for God's sake. Right, on that note, is there anything else we want to say? Do you know what, right? I was late bloody starting. It, it's two hours and 19 friggin' minutes. How, mm. the, how, how does this happen? You just go, you keep going on, you do. Yeah. <laughs> <You're cheating. laughs> <laughs> it's good, isn't it? It's interesting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you, so, you make it so interesting. We can't. Yeah. Can't stop. We can't switch it off, you see. It's our week it's so... therapy class. <laughs> mm. Yeah, bloody yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. Stimulating debate. Oh god. I, yeah. God. Right, anything right. Before we finish, anything Andy, Margaret, the stripper, Drina, uh, Anne or Peter wants to say. No, thanks. Good. Good night. Yeah. Oh, good one. She'll probably be phoning me in a week saying, I'm really upset that you calling me a stripper. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be really shocked if I appeared naked next week, wouldn't you? Oh, please, please. I, I'm fine up for it. He's oh, half naked any class anyway. That'll, that'll be the other four uh, YouTubers gone. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hang on a minute, Andy. How do you know the other four YouTubers ain't naked? <laughs> Uh, I don't, that's true. Yeah. They, they, could, hey. right, they could be watching it naked. Naked archaeology. There's a would whole programme there. I was, or would you just pretend you haven't seen? Oh, the, the, the emperor with new clothes, new clothes, yeah. Say nothing, just keep smiling. <laughs> guess, guess what, it's gone up to five people on YouTube now. For oh, that's all you had to do was mention taking your clothes off. <laughs> God, right, no. <laughs> <laughs> right, on, on that note, I'm going to call it a day. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, more of a night. Mm. Yeah, more, <laughs> well, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody on YouTube. We're going to say goodbye to Drina, Peter, and 
And Margaret and Andy will be back next week, 7.30, for another riveting instalment of <laughs> Mesolithic, Neolithic period, the transition um period. Yay. Oh. <laughs> when are you starting your pirating job? Start the Friday. Friday. Oh. This Friday. Yeah. Nice one. I wanted to shave this bloody beard off. I can't now. No. Can't have beard. Pirates have to have beards. Do you have to wear an earring? <laughs> oh, shut up. <laughs> I, no, I'm not piercing any part of my body to have a bloody earring. Thank you very much. <laughs> you suffer for your art, mate. Yeah. You can get yeah. clip-on ones that could look quite good. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it, is it, well, didn't they say that about a French tickler? You could clip one, clip one on. <laughs> <laughs> but you asked for that. <laughs> we got on to French ticklers. You did live on. Well, no, YouTube. yeah, well, you should have mentioned clip on ones, then, should you, you silly woman? <laughs> right. See you next week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What we should, what we should, what we should Bye, do, right? We should, we should just get together and just have an hour's session and go for five weeks. Right. Okay. Uh, I guess say goodbye, Andy, Bye. Margaret, and Drina, and Peter, and Anne. And I will see you next week. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Take care, guys. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. 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 Oh, that was quick. Don't forget, anyone watching online, we'll be here next week at 7.30. Um, you could have said something. I'm going to look in a chat box. Um, nothing in a chat box. Um, and again, uh, let's just... Um, at the end of this lecture, just um, like to say thanks for everybody watching and just a remembering that uh, Ross, um, Rostock, uh, rest in peace, mate. And uh, hopefully you'll be haunting me and giving me stick and uh, saving our heritage. Thank you very much. Take care, guys. Rest in peace. Take care. Bye. And see you next week, 730.